The Lord be with you. All right. If, as you can see, if you saw up on the screen, uh, this is the end of Revelation and the end of all things, but we'll see how far we get. Uh, hopefully we will complete it in a decent amount of time, and then if you have any questions at the end, we can go through some of those as well, or we can just call it good and, and uh, be done a little bit early. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear God, we ask that you would be in our midst this evening, that you would reveal yourself to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as you can see, we're now into our sixth of six cycles of visions in the Revelation of John. Uh, That's the nice purple area colored in over here. And as I showed um, each week, the cycles overlap in that they're not sequential. It's not like reading a story linearly where uh, you have a, a beginning plot and then different subplots that happen in the story and then a conclusion at the end. Revelation has a beginning and a conclusion, but the cycles in between do not necessarily um, separate from each other. There's a lot of symbolism that's happening. The best way to unravel that is to find the decoder ring, and the decoder ring is in the first cycle, chapters 1 through 3. This is where Jesus himself gives a message through John to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And these uh, seven churches can be split up into three categories of oppression. The first one being assimilation or accommodation to the wider culture. The second issue being outright persecution for being a Christian. And the third has to do with complacency. And in the third category, in the loop-de-loop, as, as in each of the loop-de-loops, things get bad, they get worse, and they get really bad. The danger of complacency is not from the world's um, persecution, but from God's judgment. And so following that, uh, John is swept up into a vision of the heavenly throne room with the sovereign God, and there's a cry going out to say, who is worthy to open the scroll, which is the will of God, that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. No one's found to be worthy, and John hears about the line of Judah, but what he looks and sees is a lamb who was slain, and the lamb is worthy to open the scroll. And with each of the seals being broken, cataclysmic events begin to happen in the world. The first four seals are broken, and the, first, uh, the four horsemen are, are um, unleashed, and with each wave of the horsemen, our areas of security become hemmed in. The furthest one out being danger from a foreign power, uh, the second one in being danger in our own backyard from, from, robbery, from robbers or from crime. Uh, the third cycle is our own pocketbook in the economy. Uh, and then the fourth one is disease and death that comes for us all that none of us can escape. Next come the fifth and sixth seals which destroy a third of the earth and causes all kind of cataclysmic things to happen, uh, the sky to fall, uh, everything. When things doesn't seem to be any worse, there's a call by God to halt so that the redeemed may be gathered. And John hears about 144,000 from the tribes of Israel. But what he sees is a great multitude from every tribe, nation, language, and background. And from that point, we enter into the third circle where angels come out now that, the, now that the scroll is opened up and the trumpets blare, letting the world know that God's will is about to be announced. The first four trumpets are a uh, repeat of the first four seals. It's the same thing of hemming in the reader. Five and six destroy the world in cataclysmic ways, with one judgment being God taking His grace away from the world and allowing that which the world worships sin, death, and the devil to have sway, and you have this locust, uh, uh, this amalgamation of creatures that come up out of the ground and begin to torment people. The result is not that the world repents, but actually worships the locusts and curses God. So God tries a different tack rather than using the wrath of God. God sends His witnesses And through the suffering of those witnesses, many come to faith, in which case the heavenly host and all creation cries the amen that begins way back in this cycle when the the, um, four living creatures sing praise to God and are joined by the great multitude. We get the amen. This ends the first act of Revelation, and we see the scene of the um, Ark of the Covenant coming down from heaven, 
and this line that God will now turn his attention to destroy the destroyers of the earth. And that gets us into the fourth cycle. Uh, from the kingdom of heaven, we hear about the dragon and the woman with the child and how the woman flees from the dragon who waits to eat the child. The dragon is that old serpent, that old enemy Satan. But the child escapes and is whisked into heaven. And in, at that point, the dragon is cast out of his influence in the heavenly courts. No longer can he accuse the saints before God as he did in the Old Testament in the book of Job. He's hemmed in just like in the previous cycles. Now the devil is hemmed in, and he's hemmed in on earth, uh, seeking to avoid the lake of fire and the bottomless pit. He empowers two others to make an unholy, or a, not an unholy, but a demonic trinity, the beast of the sea who tries to be like Jesus, while as the dragon tries to be like the father, this is Satan, and the beast of the land who is the false prophet who pretends to be the Holy Spirit. And they make war on the earth, and the entire wor uh, earth worships them as if they are God. What comes next is judgment on, and blessing on the world for the same reasons as the beasts persecute the saints. Judgment comes upon them. Again, the world does not uh, uh, turn away, but worships the beast, uh, therefore earning the judgment that is coming to them because they curse God rather than turn away from the beast. We have an imagery, uh, again, in the heavenly throne room of uh, the Lord of nations, Jesus Christ coming, and the faithful crying on Mount Zion, singing a new song to him, which leads to the seven bowls of wrath being poured out, being ready to be poured out. Earlier, I almost forgot about this, earlier during the trumpets, the seventh trumpet would have released the seven thunders, which was similar to uh, the great flood. The, the angel who stood on land and sea to deliver the seven trumpets had them sealed up. God had them sealed up. The gigantic angel wore a rainbow on his head, just like the symbol of God's mercy during, following the flood. And so that's why the witness becomes the way by which God redeems the world through the word, through the suffering and faithfulness of the saints. Uh, answering the question for those who are being persecuted here and in this cycle about how long, Lord, until you redeem us. From Mount Zion, the seven bowls of wrath are poured out, and these are similar to the ten plagues of Egypt, with each one having the effort to lead people to repent and to turn back to God more and more they curse God, curse God, showing that those who are receiving the judgment are not receiving it in vain. There is no middle ground. You're either with the lamb or you're with the beast. You're, there is no Switzerland at, at the end. Uh, those who uh, reject God, God gives every chance to repent, uh, and it's shown that their disdain is absolute. We hear about Armageddon and the, the final battle um, which is uh, in the land of Megiddo as a location, but it's symbolic for all the great wars in the Old Testament where God's people triumphed over their enemies. And then we hear about the great harlot Babylon, who is the worldly power that the demonic trinity's uh, influence works through. The harlot ends up being destroyed by the dragon and the beasts themselves, basically meaning that if you give evil enough time, it will turn in on itself. And we hear about the lament of the people who come to Babylon's funeral. There are three categories, the kings, the seafarers, and the merchants. And the kings lament that they don't have a partner to make all kinds of money and to give them all kinds of stuff for their luxurious lifestyle. The merchants lament because no one buys their stuff anymore and they can't sell all of their goods, especially their slaves and human souls. And the seafarers are sad because no one wants their, their goods and shipments anymore. So it's all self-serving and it's all vanity. But ultimately, we hear the hallelujah chorus break out because God's judgment on evil is about to come to its conclusion. And that brings us to this cycle, the sixth cycle, and so I encourage you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 19, beginning at the 11th verse, and I don't have a clicker. There we go. 
The final battle, Armageddon, is associated in our modern culture with World War III. It's so evident that even those who have never read Revelation associate the name Armageddon with World War III. However, it is in the second act of Revelation that the facts begin to play out. Remember that the second act and the final battle actually began way back in chapter 12. Here the antagonists are laid out systematically and then defeated in a reverse order. Satan is thrown from heaven to earth in chapter 12. Um, The beast and the false prophet conquer in chapter 13. The harlot rides on the beast in chapter 17. And then the harlot is destroyed by the beast in chapter 17. The beast and the false prophet are conquered in chapter 19. And Satan is thrown from earth into the abyss in chapter 20. And so Revelation chapter 19, beginning at the 11th verse, it says... Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses." From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Way back in the beginning of the plagues being sent forth, a conqueror on a white horse is given freedom to wage war. This is way back here, the first horseman. Now a new rider on a white horse appears, and it is Christ. His name is not known because names are associated with power. We pray in the name of Jesus, as did the early church, and demons are cast out in his name, and healing is given. Here, his name is not allowed to be used because Jesus' name, which means save, uh, salvation, brings mercy. This is not a time for mercy. This is a time for judgment. Uh, He has come as a warrior to defeat the adversaries of God. Chapter 19, verse 13, it says, He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. We know by tradition that John wrote the letter to Revelation. Most scholars nowadays are not convinced that he did. However, the earliest church fathers said John wrote Revelation. Um, We know that John wrote the Gospel of John according to these same church fathers. They're known as the Anti-Nessene Fathers. This verse is one that gives a clue that it is indeed John the Apostle who wrote Revelation because he's the only person who gives Jesus the name Word of God. When you read John chapter 1, we hear that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, yes. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory as the Father's only Son, right? Here, Revelation plays on that. The difference between the two is that they're two different literary forms. Revelation is apocalyptic literature, whereas... um, uh, John's gospel is, is historical narrative. And so John is writing in two different ways, but there's actually a lot of overlap between the gospel of John and Revelation, as well as 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Here it says, On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. It's no mistake that this writer is Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus does not usurp God's power. Instead, he is God revealed. His robe is dipped in blood, showing his unique method of conquering. Remember that John heard the lion was coming. What he actually sees, though, is the lamb who conquers through his death and resurrection. We've heard that word over and over again, that word conquer. That's the word Nike. It means victory, and it was the primary ethic of Rome. If you were to say, what is the primary ethic of the United States, um, whether you believe it or not, I think most of us would say liberty or freedom, uh, individual rights. 
So the world that Rome is based on, even though it, it, we come out of the tradition of Rome in the Western culture, their primary driver was not liberty or individual rights, which has spread around the world today, but at that time it was victory. It was conquering. Jesus in Revelation conquers in a very unique way because he conquers by suffering for others and dying on the cross. Now he comes in glory not as uh, the slain lamb, but the lamb who was raised and the son of God and God himself coming in his glory in order to deliver the judgment that he rightly has to give because he has suffered for the world and redeemed the world for his sake. Um, If we turn to Isaiah 63, verses 2 through 4, Read that out loud. You may remember early on, Pastor Cross said, if you want to get a good understanding of Revelation, go to Isaiah. Because Revelation really digs into Isaiah a lot more than many of the books. John alludes to imagery in the Old Testament all over the place. But Isaiah is where he gets his, his meat and he fleshes it out. Um, 63, 2 through 4, it says, uh, Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. Um, Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy here in Revelation. What John hears is the conqueror in Isaiah, and what he sees is Christ himself. Now, Christ has the authority to confront the nations because he suffered for the nations. The warriors who ride with Jesus are not arrayed in battle dress. They don't have on armor. Instead, they wear the white robes of the redeemed that we hear about in the first cycle when Jesus says to them, if you will conquer, I will clothe you in the white robes of the redeemed. And the martyrs also wear white robes, and the elders in heaven wear white robes. Um, Those who have been cleansed by Christ, it is a victory over the enemies of God, sin, death, and the devil, and they are called to resist sin and evil. This is done by the way that they live and die, in faith. Faith is the key here. That's how you conquer. They conquer the forces of evil by faithfulness to Christ, who has conquered all. Now, some find this imagery of the faithful as the army of God disturbing because it could promote militancy. In fact, if anyone ever says to you, we need to go conquer the ungodly for Christ, understand they've not been talking to Christ. Maybe an antichrist, but not Christ. Because that's not what Revelation reveals. Conquering is shown through faithfulness in the face of sin and evil. And if we read real closely, what does this army actually do? Nothing. Nada. Zip. Zilch. They're Jesus' entourage. They go along for the ride. They go where Jesus goes. Finally, all of the actions of this final battle are Christ's. He is the one who judges and makes war in chapter 19. From his mouth is the sharp sword. He will rule with the rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of God's wrath. We heard about that last week. The, the imagery that um, was the, um, I guess, the influence for uh, the battle hymn of the, Pro- of, of the Republic that speaks about the winepress of God's wrath. The only weapon mentioned is the sword from Christ's mouth, which is the Word. Christ carries out God's wrath, not the faithful. So now we're going to turn to Revelation 19, verses 17 through 21. We're going to turn toward the beast and his allies. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. 
and the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Ew. Anyone ever see that, that Alfred Hitchcock movie, Birds? Ugh. Still gives me the heebie-jeebies, and it's an old movie. Now, great flocks of birds are summoned to the feast of God. Where do we hear about this feast of God? We turn to Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 17 through 20. Again, all the imagery that John uses is found in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 39. Verses 17 through 20, it says, As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to the birds of every sword and to all beasts of the field. Assemble and come, gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you, a great sacrificial feast on the mountain of Israel, on the mountains of Israel, and you shall eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of he goats, of bulls, all of them fat beasts of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you are filled and drink blood till you are drunk at the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you. And you shall be filled at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men and all kinds of warriors, declares the Lord God. I should have asked this beforehand. Is everyone here over the age of 30? Okay. It used to be in the old days, the rabbis forbade anyone under the age of 30 to read Ezekiel because it's so gory. So, I'm glad that we're all adult enough to be able to handle the imagery that came out of there. But notice who God was speaking to. He was speaking to one like a son of man. And who does Jesus refer to himself as? The son of man. And it's referring back to Adam and Eve. Uh, Not just Daniel. The point being that Jesus is more than the Messiah. He's more than a great prophet. He's more than a great king. He's the promised one going all the way back to when the serpent first tempted Adam and Eve, the one who would strike the serpent's head. He is the son of man. God made this promise to say, you will have a, a, an offspring. The word is, is seed, and it's singular, a blessed seed. Well, who is, who is the son of Adam? The son of man, because Adam means man. It also means land, but in this case, it means son of man. And that's the connotation through this whole thing. That at the judgment of all things, God's chosen, who turns out to be not just God's chosen, not just the Son of Man, but the Son of God, and even God Himself is the one who will deliver and save and ultimately bring an end to sin, death, the devil, and evil. If you look about uh, uh, the battle that's happening... We hear about them getting all lined up, but it's not much of a battle at all. Uh, The beast is captured right away, and everyone else, and so is the the false prophet, and everyone else is is slain by the word of God. Uh, When Christ's word does its work, there is finality here. We may be disturbed by the grotesque imagery of the Christ warrior and wish that John would rewrite the script. I mean, this is not the Jesus that we've become accustomed to. He's not the baby Jesus in the manger. And he's not the the suffering servant on the cross. Like I said, this is the risen Lord Jesus who's come a second time not to redeem um, sinners through faith in him, but to judge the idolatrous and the godless who make war against those whom God seeks to be merciful to sin, death, the devil, evil, and all who refuse God's grace. The point, though, is not to let the lamb and the beast reconcile with one another. There is no middle ground. There is no conciliation. There is no ceasefire between good and evil in the end. The imagery here is meant to be disturbing to you. It's to lull us out of a sense of complacency. Remember, that was the biggest issue. This is the thing that John is most warning against. 
Persecution is going to come. Temptation to accommodate culture is going to come. But if we fall into this, that's where the real danger is. That's where the warning needs to come. This is the end of the destroyers of the earth. And so obedience to the Lamb is defiance to the beast. The gross supper of God is the counter vision to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is the warning and promise which we see throughout most of Revelation. And faith is the opposite of fear and complacency. So here's the one that gets everyone's attention. The Millennial Kingdom. At the beginning of the summer, we talked a little bit about premillennial dispensationalism and amillennialism and postmillennialism and all the millennialisms. Well, this is the chapter where all those different interpretations come from. So turn with me to uh, Revelation 20, and we'll start with verses 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So, John is attacking our perceptions of time and space here. Again, premillennialism, postmillennialism, all the millennialisms seek to put on the timeline what is not meant to be by God on a timeline. Um, God really means it when, when Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour except the Father. He kind of means that. And so even as Revelation is written, it's, it's not a smooth map. These cycles keep, keep repeating, repeating, repeating. And so even here, it's not clear. You can't locate the bottomless pit. And you can't even locate what a thousand years means. It's very vague in both terms. Um, We cannot understand or take the binding of the dragon for a thousand years as a literal stretch of time. John is using word pictures to convey a very real truth. And the truth is this. Satan is defeated. Each are word pictures conveying the fullness of the sentence. Satan is bound for a full period of time which God has decided upon. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, it says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such a second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with Him for a thousand years. Interestingly, John never lets us know if this thousand-year kingdom will be on earth or in heaven. Also, he does not allude to the promises associated with the millennial kingdom in Isaiah chapter 65. Instead, he only associates the millennial kingdom with the new heaven and new earth. In either case, whether on earth or in heaven, close reading of the text helps us to avoid speculation on what we do and do not know. Notice that the saints are always referred to in relational terms. It isn't that they reigned on earth for a thousand years, but that they reigned with Christ. Where Christ is, there the saints are as well. When talking about end-of-life things and what's going to happen next, it's always good to keep Jesus' word in mind. You know, some theologians have talked about different realities at at your deathbed. What happens after you die? 
Do you go into, Martin Luther spoke of a soul sleep, where you're in the ground until the judgment comes, uh, but no time passes, you don't even notice. Um, others speak of, of you're in heaven, and you're going to be in heaven, and, and that's, that's where you're going to be until the end times come. Both are imagery that come out of the Bible. We hear about sleeping from Paul. We hear about the heavenly imagery here in Revelation. I go with Jesus on this one. Um, rather than speculate about what heaven is going to be like, trusting Jesus is always a good way to go. Uh, when, the, when the thief on the cross says to him, you know, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus says, today I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. There's a promise you can take to the bank. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen the next moment after you leave time and space, because that's what happens when you die. You are no longer limited to time and space. I've told you all this stuff before, right? Okay, so there's really only four dimensions that we all are aware of. There are more according to quantum physicists and other scientists that work in, in those type of, of uh, theoretical ideas of reality that there are multiple dimensions. We only see four. Do you know what the four are? You have space, which is forward and back, up and down, left and right. Okay? Three dimensions. That's where we get 3D. It's really only 2D, but it's a different story. And then we have a fourth dimension that we can't see. We can, we can measure it, there are certain um, experiments that you can do where if you have light travel around the earth, it actually changes its pace after a certain rotation. So we can see that time ha can be measured in, a, in, an, in, a, in an abstract way, in a physical way, but we know time based on decay, how thi entropy, how things um, fade, and we call that time. So we have Four dimensions, up, down, left, right, forward, back, and time, space and time. When you die, your soul is no longer limited to space and time. You're now outside of it. So think of it like this. God created everything, so God is outside of space and time, right? When you die, you're outside of space and time. So if this is all of history, God can be both the alpha and the omega at the same time. See how I'm doing that? That's God. That's not us. However, and this is just speculation, it's how my mind thinks about this stuff, outside of the promise of Jesus that I'm going to be with him after I die, I don't know how that's going to work, I'm going to leave that to him, my mind can't wrap it around space and time, I can wrap my head around the idea that the next moment, not, not, not period of time, the next moment, my next experience will be in the presence of the Lord. And, it, and it's outside of space and time. Now, here's the wacky part. And this is just speculation, so don't, don't call me a heretic just yet, okay? I'm not, I'm not claiming this on Scripture. It's just how my mind works. The very next moment that I experience Christ after I die is the same moment that my mom experienced Christ and my grandmother and my grandfather and all the saints down the line. The next moment is with Christ as He ushers in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, is it like that? I don't know. But that's one way to understand all the different imagery that Scripture gives about what life is like after you die. Bottom line is, it's going to be with Christ, and it's going to be better than you can imagine. Um, your loved ones are looking down from heaven saying, you don't know how good it is. That's what we're talking about here. Okay? The old is coming to an end. Evil is coming to an end. Evil and sin and death are going away forever. We can't even wrap our heads around it because our reality is defined by those things. Our experiences are tainted by sin. I mean, a perfect example is a parent. When I was a young parent, well, I could say it now, I have a puppy, but when I was a young parent, right? New baby, love her more than I didn't even know what love was. I, I thought I loved my wife, thought I knew what love was by loving my wife. Nope, have this baby. Didn't even know you could love something so much. And yet at four in the morning, when my daughter is crying 
because she's pooped herself and needs to be changed. Do you think my response was, aha, the Lord is calling me to my vocation of father. I will gladly leap on over and take care of my child who needs me out of the love that is expressed by God to me for her. My response was, it's your turn. Well, that's a sinner. That's a sinner who's selfish rather than selfless. And our entire reality is tainted by that. We, we can't imagine reality without the reality of sin. And we can't imagine time without the reality of death. See how those things work? We're tainted by them. Heaven's going to be a whole different ballgame. And the new heaven and the new earth are going to be a whole different ballgame. We can't even imagine. So back to Revelation 20. All right, so who are the saints who reign with Christ? First of all, John gives three categories. He says those who sit on thrones. He says those who were beheaded for their witness. And he says those who have not worshipped the beast. The first and the second death. Revelation is unique in the Bible for this language here. It's an assurance to the faithful. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, you were baptized into his death. The point being that, and the imagery lays this out too, because you know Christ now, you've already gone through the first death. The old sinner has already been redeemed. The new Adam, the new Eve, the new person that is in Christ is already alive. It's not perfect. We still have the old Adam and Eve hanging around our neck. This is what Martin Luther called simul justus et peccator. We are simultaneously saint and sinner in this life. And from the moment Christ tackles you, you spend the rest of your life getting used to the fact that you have a Savior and putting the old away. Um, but that's the first death. And it's symbolized, the sign of your first death is your baptism. And daily we're to drown the old Adam and the old Eve in, through repentance in the promises of your baptism. Drown them in your baptismal waters so that the new saint who lives by faith in Christ can emerge. The point being for the faithful that you will not suffer the second death. You are vindicated in Christ. Your body may die, but you won't. All others, however, may be subject to the second death, and that's for those who have no faith in Christ. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom, was not the final destination, but is one more vision on the way to the new Jerusalem. That's the end. Gog and Magog come from Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, and these are the culmination of all the enemies of God at the last judgment. We've already heard a little bit about this. The imagery of Armageddon alludes to it. Um, I haven't been writing stuff on the board. But we've already heard about the enemies of God gathering and uh, with, with the, the beast of the sea and the beast of the land and being defeated by Jesus through the word. This is a repeat of that same vision. It's basically saying you can't lock it down in one location, but that where there is evil... And where evil is allowed to operate, there will always be those who turn away from God and chase after and follow evil. That's the point that John is making here. Nations that Satan musters to mount a final attack, uh, John moves Ezekiel's imagery around. In Ezekiel, there is the supper of God that we just heard about, all the birds, the gross birds, after the defeat of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel chapter 38. And this leads to the New Jerusalem. The outcome described by Ezekiel and John, though different in sequence, is the same. It's deliverance from God, or by God. 
And there are some insights to note. First of all, Satan, after serving his thousand-year sentence, goes right back to his old ways, attacking God and the faithful by enticing nations to turn away from God. There is no compromising with Satan, and there is no repentance. I mean, wouldn't it be just a much nicer two-hour movie that would wrap up a blockbuster if Satan turned from his ways and suddenly became, you know, buddies with Jesus, and you have a good buddy story? I mean, that, wouldn't that be a great story? But the fact of the matter is that's not who Satan is. And that's not the, there's not a, not a cosmic comedy going on here. Uh, Satan is, is the great enemy, and his enemy is God. Um, he's the first to rebel, according to the biblical witness and, and narrative of tradition. And where there is Satan, there is not going to be any repentance. Satan is not going to turn back to God. Um, where Satan is working, there will be evil and suffering in the world. Therefore, the faithful must not compromise in the face of evil, confident that God will not compromise, but will bring Satan's rampage to an end. Second point, and I already mentioned this. All of God's adversaries were defeated with the millennial kingdom. However, until evil is finally removed from reality, removed completely, there will always be those who turn away from God. That is the promise in the New Jerusalem, because in the New Jerusalem, there is no evil. There is no suffering. There is no sin. It's reality without sin, death, and the devil. We're going to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades, or hell, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Again, we have the imagery of judgment and promise, warning and promise. In the Old Testament, you're judged by what you do, how you keep the law, your deeds. The gospel is defined not by what you do, but what Christ has done for you. And so when John speaks about books were opened, but then he says, and then another book was opened, the book of life. This is the book of life is, is um, the book written for those who are redeemed by Christ, that Christ's deeds rest upon you, not your own. That's what John is doing here. He's been doing it the entire time through Revelation. This is what it says in the Old Testament, but this is what God is doing. And what God is doing is always much bigger and grander than what the Old Testament uh, was supposed to point forward. All people, great and small, render an account before the sovereign. They're based on two books, the book of life and the book of deeds. God does care about what we do with our lives. This is not for us to despair of grace, but to see the book of deeds for what it is, a warning and a promise. God's decision for mercy is finally based on grace found in the book of life. Is my name written in the book, we might ask. Here's John's advice. Trust that the Lamb who liberates people from every tribe, language, people, and nation for life with God, that He also died for you. Trust that God wants you to put this hope into practice in your daily life. Then leave the final judgment, thankfully, in God's hands. Now we come to the new Jerusalem, Revelation 21. kind of blew it on this stuff. Verses 1 through 8, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who Nikes will have this heritage. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars... Their portion shall be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The new creation is marked not by what it has, but what it doesn't have, by an absence of powers that oppose God and attack life. The harlot was an end to powers that reduced creation and its people to mere commodities to be bought and exploited to satisfy the self-indulgent and powerful. Satan, the beast, and their allies eliminated powers that dominated the nations and oppressed the faithful. The resurrection of all the dead brought an end to death itself. In the new creation, there is an absence of death, mourning, crying, pain. For all those marks of the former fallen world have passed away. Sin, death, and the devil are gone. Let me tell you something. Heaven is not going to be boring. Uh, You're not sitting on a cloud playing a harp. Uh, A better way to think of heaven is the absence of all the things that bring misery and true joy all the time, being truly known, being truly loved, experiencing that to its completion. Uh, Paul speaks about it like this. Now we see through a mirror dimly. This is in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, the love chapter. He says now, it's actually about a lot more than than marriage by far. Um, Now we see through a mirror dimly, then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, just as I am fully known. Think about that. Colors will be a thousand times brighter. Music will be a thousand times sweeter. Food will be a thousand times more delicious. Joy, true joy and contentment. That's what heaven is. It's, tr- it's life to its fullness without death. New creation is marked by the presence of God who gives life. Each verse in this section recalls promises from the prophets. The first one is... Um, Isaiah 65, 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. John is quoting all of these at uh, the formation of, of the new Jerusalem. Ezekiel 37, 27 says, My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Isaiah 25, verse 8 says, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away fears, uh, tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 43, 19, it says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Each one of those verses speaks of the new reality that is with God. It's like the Garden of Eden all over again, where God takes care of all of our needs and is with us all the time. There's never a question of, where are you, God? It's me, DJ. Uh, God's there in a way that you can experience Him fully. Revelation 21, verses 9 through 21, it says, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a gate the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, if you know your gems, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrys, we'll just call it Chrysler, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. Ever heard the term pearly gates? This is where it comes from. And the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. So, you may not know those measurements. I didn't learn what cubits were in school. Maybe you did, didn't either, but I've done some extrapolations for you. It's a perfect cube, 1,500 miles wide. It would take up the entire center of the United States, and it would go 1,500 miles into space. That's a big city. That's a big temple. Um, that's the imagery of the new heaven and the new earth, God's resting place in our midst. It's the temple of God, but it's not a human temple. It's God's dwelling place. It's where God chooses to be in its full glory. Uh, 21, 22 through 22, 5. It says... And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No, one will there, uh, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more." They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. There's three gates on every side that are always open. Why? Because evil is gone. Sin, death, and the devil are gone. There's no need for security. Think of the imagery here of these pearly gates with kind of the imagery that we have about St. Peter's gates. You go up to heaven and St. Peter's sitting there like a concierge to see whether or not you're, you're willing to go in. The imagery of Revelation is much more freeing. Those who are written in the, in the book of life are given new life and total freedom and free access to God and God's goodness at any time. There's, no, there, there's nothing separating you. Nothing at all. It's true freedom. Now, finally, the end is near. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon, Jesus says. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, 
and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, Jesus says, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. And notice what Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Christ is the beginning and end of our revelation. This is an A for the Greek alpha, and this is uh, the Greek omega, the beginning and the end. It could be the A and the Z would be another way of saying it. The revelation in Revelation is that Jesus Christ is the Lord. It's that simple. There's not all kinds of revelations. This is the revelation. And there is no wiggle room. Christ is a line drawn in the sand. Where there is faith in Christ, there is salvation. Where there is not faith in Christ, there is not salvation. Jesus died for you. And everything is in his hands. Hope in that. Because it is yours. And live your life receiving warning and promise, law and gospel, to correct yourself so that you cling ever tighter to the cross.